Okay, I'm going to call this meeting of the Gloucester uh, School Committee to order. Um, this meeting is recorded by video and audio in accordance with open meeting law, consistent with the governor's orders suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law and banning, banning gatherings of more than 10 people. This meeting will uh, be conducted by remote participation uh, because this is a special meeting. There will be no oral communications tonight. Um, so, uh, Maria, could we have a roll call vote for uh, attendance for the school committee? Mayor Taken. Here. Ms. Watson. Here. Ms. Wieson. Here. Kathy Clancy. I don't think she's joined yet. Mr. Favaza is not here. And Chairman Pope. Here. So. And yeah. Ms. Prince is no, not here. Yeah, we, we have a quorum. Uh, I'll turn it over to Council President LeBlanc. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so I would like to call to order the City Council for the special City Council um, joint meeting with the School Committee of May 13th. And in attendance this evening, in no particular order, we have Councilor Pett, we have myself, Councilor LeBlanc, we have Councilor Gilman, we have Councilor Holmgren and we have Councilor O'Hara. We do have a quorum of the city council. Um, we are short a few councilors this, councilors this evening, but uh, we, won't, we won't be voting on anything. So we don't need um, any more than what we have. So, and I'll hand it back over to you, Mr. Pope, Cha uh, Chairman Pope. Okay, thank, thank you, uh, Council, Pres council President LeBlanc. Um, we have three items um, for uh, presentations tonight. Uh, the vocational program at, at the high school, um, traffic at the um, elementary schools and our long-term capital planning for the schools. Um, and we're gonna start with um, the um, vocational program at the high school and I'm gonna turn it over to um, uh, Superintendent Lummis and um, Principal Cook, James Cook is here to, um, to um, help present, uh, probably do the presentation. And um, uh, I believe somebody's gonna need um, permission to share their screen. Is it gonna be you? Or I, I, I have it. I, I, we're all set. Thank you, um, Chairman, Chairman Pope. So uh, good evening, folks. Um, thanks for uh, having us here tonight. We are um, going to share with you some updates on uh, career, voc career and voc vocational technical education, also school arrival and dismissal, and also capital planning. Really appreciate uh, the chairs working together to create an agenda that is um, so, so very informative, first of all, on some important topics. Um, but also limited. Um, these are these are you know topics that we'll go through in depth to update the the city council. Um, there are things we've been working with with the school school committee um, for a while now. But um, have some updates. But just excited to be here and appreciate your time and attention. So I'm going to share my screen here. Um, actually, let me stop that. I don't think I did that correctly. Uh, here we go for take two. Yeah, that's better. Okay, so there's the plan for tonight. Uh, we'll start it off with um, uh, Principal James Cook from the uh, Gloucester High School, of course. And um, I'll chime in later, but uh, just really pleased with uh, the work of our teachers in our career about tech program this year. Really pleased with the work of the students. Uh, James will talk a lot more in detail about that, but just really appreciate their sticking with it, working hard, getting our students into these programs, um, in these really high quality programs uh, this year, all year long, make sure they're on site in person and uh, doing the great hands-on work and think work and thinking that they do. So, but I'll hand it off to Principal Cook. James, go ahead and I'll just tell me when you want me to change the slides. That's good, Ben, thank you. And, and thank you for this uh, opportunity. Um, the school committee has um, seen most of this uh, previously, though there is some new updated information about next year. And uh, it's a, uh, just great to be able to share uh, this aspect of our school um, that involves approximately an eighth of the students at Gloucester High School um, and share this with, with all of you and with the folks who are uh, tuning in tonight. Um, so in the next slide, um, There you go. Uh, you get a, I wanted to give a kind of overview for, for people who maybe aren't as intimately involved in the schools about um, what our career vocational technical education has looked like from last March to 
getting back to school. Like what, what did we have to do to get these programs up and running? Um, so um, the CVT programs uh, are really at the heart of the vision of our, uh, the vision of the graduate that we have. So um, you, you uh, folks might not be familiar with the concept of a vision of the graduate, but it's similar to a mission statement, right? But it, instead of focusing on the mission of the institution, it really focuses on the students themselves. So our vision is of uh, students who um, have the integrity and the foundational knowledge, but most importantly, the problem solving communication and collaboration skills needed for productive citizenship, right? So the vocational programs really exemplify that problem solving, that communication and that collaboration um, that they use uh, academically to learn their trades and also apply it to uh, all the work that they do that um, interacts with the public in, in various ways um, as they build not only the skills in the occupation, but the, the entrepreneurial skills um, and the employability skills uh, needed to transition um, into productive citizenship after high school. So uh, back in March, um, right before uh, we, um, uh, the kind of close down of everything, we were able to re uh, configure the ways that we reach out to families and reach out to kids to make sure we were still able to get the incoming eighth graders, uh, uh, you know, the rising uh, ninth grade students going from eighth to ninth into these programs. So we had um, a parent course selection night, uh, we had a CVTE open house, uh, we had a remote CVTE application process and selection process. Um, so that at the beginning of the summer, we had capacity, uh, which is uh, 15 students per instructor for the incoming folks into our, our, into our programs. Um, then over the summer, we had to use the special guidance uh, provided for the COVID year to prepare these, uh, these programs, which really need to be in person, right? The, the aspects can be virtual, but so much of the work does need to be in person in some kind of safe and adapted way. So, um, so we spent, we worked all summer to, to make that happen so that um, the Monday after uh, the earliest we could be in school in this adjusted year, we were able to have in-person instruction in our vocational programs before we had a, a hybrid in-person program for, 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 the, for our other students, for, um, which happened in October. So, but in the vocational programs, we were able to get ready to bring those kids into in-person instruction uh, almost immediately at the beginning of the year because of all the work to get ready. So in the next slide, Ben, that gets us to the beginning of this school year and, and kind of an update to things. Um, we were able to look ahead to our sustainable improvement. What are the particular areas we're looking to grow and improve in our vocational programs? So uh, we launched a, um, over the last couple of years an exploration of career tech program uh, and, and the function that serves is, yeah, most of our students still come from eighth to ninth grade so that they have four years in a vocational program. But we wanted to also expose students when they get here to Gloucester High School, students who maybe hadn't already been thinking about a vocational education, a career vocational education, um, to be able to explore um, our electricity and advanced manufacturing programs, which is where we had the lowest enrollment. So with what we were able to do is have kids do this kind of um, exploration for a semester and then decide on going into one of one of the two programs that allowed us to grow our numbers in those two areas. We've also been working hard to um, review, update and expand our curriculum with particular focus on the employability and entrepreneurship uh, aspects of, of the work, as well as through upgrades in technology, bringing in some more um, you know, uh, industry standard um, lessons using the upgraded equipment into our programs. We've added, of course, like everywhere else in the schools, we added online resources so that the parts that had to be done uh, remotely could be done remotely, um, including safety uh, work, um, uh, something called today's classroom that we use in our auto shop quite heavily, um, different uh, applications in the advanced manufacturing program that can now be done in cloud applications uh, for students at home. And also we wanted to increase the general and program advisory boards. These are the folks we partner with uh, uh, that are outside the school that help advise these programs um, and inform the future improvements. So that's some of the stuff we've been working on. In the next slide, um, for folks who aren't aware of our chapter 74 programs right now, 
We have an advanced manufacturing machine technology program. Some folks may have seen in the paper, uh, I think it was yesterday on the front page, uh, talking about the ways that our advanced manufacturing classes will extend into some adult education this summer, including young adults who are our recent graduates who will be getting some additional advanced manufacturing training on, on some of this uh, state-of-the-art equipment we've been able to add over the last couple of years. We have a, our uh, automotive technology program, a carpentry technology, and an electricity uh, technology program are our uh, chapter 74 CVTE programs. We also have a cabinet making program that's a non chapter 74 CVTE program, but I'll be focusing on um, these particular comprehensive programs today. All right, so first up is our advanced manufacturing program. There, our instructor is uh, Matt Coy, who again, you may have seen um, with some words about in the, in the paper yesterday. Um, some of the things we've been up to is our advanced manufacturing computer lab and classroom have been redesigned and upgraded. Uh, I mentioned the design here because we were able to rearrange the room in a way to make it uh, more um, just uh, more educationally beneficial so that the way the stations are oriented, the space the students have at the station, um, just work better for the, the kind of uh, computer assisted design work that they're doing in there. Um, so that's, that's an upgrade. Um, we've been able to, with some uh, Chapter 74 grant funds, update the tooling for milling machines and lathes. So make sure we have the tooling necessary for the new equipment, you know, um, the, the lathes and the, and the milling machines now have the tooling that, that goes with them um, the most updated. And then, as I mentioned before, the cloud-based instructional technology. So more of the work can be done remotely as well as in person. Um, the Advanced Manufacturing Expansion Program is what was uh, mentioned most recently in the Gloucester Daily Times. All right, uh, here's a look. Whoop, you can go to the next slide, Ben. <laughs> here's a look at uh, the, uh, that newly uh, designed, um, the kind of classroom area that's newly designed. Um, and then um, you can see uh, some of the work, uh, one of the pieces the students created this year. In the next slide, we move into the automotive uh, tech. Uh, we have two teachers in this area um, because of some grant funding, Jack Porter and uh, Bud Mayshall. And uh, you know, we've been able to increase staffing there so we don't have to turn kids away from this program. And I'll say a little bit more about that because um, we just, today I got this year's um, application numbers, which look really good. And I'll share those with you tonight. Um, the, uh, we were able to purchase uh, new equipment with our budget plus uh, Perkins grant funds, uh, new lifts, wheel service equipment. I'll show you a couple of pictures in a moment. Um, we also, in this COVID year, because we can't interact with the public like we're used to, having folks um, you know, from the community, we serve the community through our auto shop. Um, instead, this year, we've had cars donated, and I'll show you that in a minute, too. And students have been working on these cars that have been donated uh, to make sure they get the comprehensive range of the different kinds of skills they need to, to develop. So in the next slide, you'll see that um, here you get to see the lifts, brand new lifts. Um, you get to see the road force tire balance that mimics, uh, you know, what happens to tires on the road. So to make sure the kids are... Uh, um, able to, to balance the tires. And then this, uh, the tire changer, this is all some of the newly upgraded equipment that we have. Um, and thanks to the funding, uh, some of this was with grant funding, but some of this was also from the, the budget that the school committee supported for these programs. In the next slide, you can see all, all those cars are donated. Um, so students are working on donated cars, everything from you know tires, transmissions, ignitions, emissions, brakes, basically everything. Um, are they able to work through, even through COVID um, and not being able to interact with the public because of these donations that uh, we've been able to procure. And the folks that are on the advisory committee have helped with that. All right, so jumping in uh, to carpentry, um, we have um, Mr. Stephen Abel, and then um, we have a, a, a support professional, uh, Herb Stillman, um, who work in that program. Some of the things the students have done. Um, they, they built desks for remote academy students. They built a partition for the preschool multi-purpose room. And then they've been working on various sheds. You can see a couple samples uh, here in this slide. Some of the things they've been doing, even with the impediments of, of, um, of COVID this year. Um, still, again, each of these projects develops different skills that the students need. Um, including some things I saw today, some new work, uh, win windows and framing, sorts of things that um, the uh, teachers shared with me today. 
the, in the next slide, you can see uh, some other COVID innovations. Uh, so what you're looking at here um, in our electricity program with Bob Devlin um, is a mobile COVID-19 uh, compliant electric electricity wiring board that allows students to do this wiring at distance um, in, in the space. So it allows us a better use of the space so we could keep that, uh, the distance we need to maintain between the students. Um, so instead of these booths that were too close, too tight, um, Bob uh, was able to use this year's budget to uh, update in this way. Next year, we have a, a CVTE solar panel collaboration project. So all the chapter 74 programs will be working on some uh, solar panels. The core work is the electricity shop, but it will involve all three, you know, the other three shops in addition to electricity. So that's coming up next year. Um, so that's just a sample. You can tell I'm, I'm moving fast. I could talk, those of you who have heard me present on these programs before know I could, could, could go on and, and I've learned so much every time I walk into those shops. So this is what it looks like for enrollment. So um, you can see um, our advanced manufacturing program was where we, we had some, some of our lower numbers. And if you go back even a few years before, the numbers were a little bit lower than that. We've been able to increase the numbers uh, based on some of the upgrades we've done in advanced manufacturing. And then you'll see in this year coming, um, based on the selections and applicants, um, we will be making another uh, leap in our um, improvement there. If some of our students hadn't chosen to go remote this year, we would have had 25 students. Next year, we're looking at 29 to 32, um, depending on um, the, the reason it's a range is some students have a first choice and a second choice situation as they come up from O'Malley. Our automotive tech courses took the biggest hit this year. Oop, uh, uh, in the second uh, row, you'll see our automotive tech class took the biggest hit this year um, due to um, COVID, but next year, the selections are looking fantastic. So we'll really be able to make full use of our two instructors in those courses. Um, carpentry, similarly, you can see um, the, the increase in selections and applicants in the carpentry tech program. And electricity is really really had the the, the you know a, a tremendous leap as well this year in terms of the selections from the the rising uh, students as well as um, students who have elected to continue in the program. Um, so we're really uh, looking forward to um, a continued uh, growth in these programs next year, um, particularly after losing a little uh, some students who went remote this year, um, bringing some of our numbers down a little bit. And these are hot off the press. So you're among the first people to see the no new numbers this, this year. Um, all right, what's coming right now? You know, what's, what's here to the end? So um, as I, I just, those electronic applications uh, are now in and, and you, you've gotten to take a look at the preliminary numbers for next year. Uh, we've shared a video with eighth grade students and families that, um, uh, fe that some of our students put together that really featured our CVTE program. We're interested after talking today and doing some kind of uh, polling of the kids who elected CVT classes to see if this video had a big impact on them. You know, what is that part of the reason? Even though we couldn't get into the schools and do our usual assembly, what is it that uh, we were worried that not being able to do our usual um, assembly with the students, we do two assemblies on CVTE, um, that we'd lose kids. Uh, and we're hoping, we're thinking that the video, which was really student created and student-based, um, we're thinking that may have helped us bridge, bridge the gap um, and, and make up for not being able to do the assemblies. Um, yeah, we've had the um, eighth grade uh, students and families uh, who are in, interested in the programs. Uh, right now, we're in the middle of general and program advisory meetings are happening uh, all in this kind of two week period we're in. Um, and then we've added uh, some opportunities. So what about students who you know, might wanna learn some small engine repair? Right? What about some students who want some basic carpentry skills? We do have some space in our afternoons where we have the upper level students. Um, and, and what we've looked to do is add some electives that will run concurrently with the upper level students um, who have a full afternoon of vocational. Students from uh, who non chapter 74 vocational students will be able to take a block in um, you know, subjects such as um, small machine repair, um, partially taught by the students who have been in the program for four years. That's something re we're really excited about being able to offer next year. And, 
and you know, fill a need uh, for kids who maybe didn't get into a CBT program, but are interested in some of the topics. So that's a, something we're looking forward to trying next year. And also we have this continued focus on um, the employability and entrepreneurship aspects of the courses. You know, not just the skills that are specific to um, the shops, but those um, employability skills and then, you know, the be becoming an entrepreneur, um, you know, the business aspects of, of these jobs. And, and um, we're excited about moving into those areas more explicitly um, and improving those areas with our, um, each of our programs. So those that kind of takes you through our chapter 74 programs, but we have some other things too in the area of CVTE. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, an Essex North Shore Agricultural and Technical School partnership that we have. So 11th and 12th grade GHS students are able to complete uh, part of their day here to, to keep completing their academic requirements. And they take a bus down uh, to the, um, the Essex Tech campus where they can take these four courses. Um, up to this point, we've only had students take the construction craft laborer program, but it is an amazing program. Um, and we're, we're hoping to, to get some students to take advantage of the three other programs as well. But the CCL program um, has really uh, done amazing things for the kids who have, have, have um, again, not elected a, uh, one of our programs, freshman and sophomore year, but get to junior year and think, wow, I'm really interested in a, in a vocational program. It's too late to complete one of the four-year programs we have in-house, but we have this other option for the, for the students who, who, who figure out later that they, they're interested in a vocational program. All right, next slide. All right, so here, um, and Ben, you feel free to jump in here because this is where this is our partnered work here. Um, this is what we're, this is the larger picture of uh, moving forward with these programs not just with the programs we have, but really looking at, at, at what we can do. So we have two uh, big goals. Um, one is to strengthen, grow the programs we have. And that's what I've been talking about for the presentation. The other part is to expand the, with additional programs, specifically programs that can allow us to enroll more students and a broader range of students. Students we might not be reaching now with the uh, programs that we're offering. Oops, hold on. James, if you want to do these next two slides, then I'll do the last one. How about that? Okay, sounds good. Um, so again, as you've been hearing about, we're um, uh, engaging in sustainable improvement with equipment, curriculum, and learning opportunities in each program. As you heard about, we've been partnering with O'Malley to present our programs in engaging ways, even when we can't get an assembly down there. Um, and then we're developing these uh, partnerships through our program advisory committees. And, and again, we're in that window of meeting with those uh, program advisory committees right now. Things we need to do is strengthen our communication with students and families about CVTE programs. And I think tonight is part of that with the audience that we have here and with you folks who all have connections throughout the community. So you are informed to be able to talk about the programs we have. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, we wanna create increasing industry partnerships, internships, and really grow our co-ops that we have for these. So that fourth year for our students, they're spending most of the time outside of the building during the, the, the CVTE part of their day. Uh, we want to create more articulation agreements uh, with um, post-secondary institutions, training opportunities, um, and so that students are able to um, get uh, credit beyond uh, just to their high school graduation credit, and we've added some of those. Um, gather more information about program graduates, right? So what can, can we learn more about what happens to our students after they graduate from high school? And then we need to maximize all our funding sources. You've heard about grant opportunities, donation op uh, donations we use, as well as our core budget to make this stuff happen. And we wanna be able to do more of that to make sure we're getting all the dollars we can into these programs. The second goal um, is to expand the CVT program with, uh, with some additional programs. Right, so we can get at some students we're not currently um, enticing into a career vocational path. So we want to explore uh, new cost-effective programs. And one program I'm really excited about is the practical nursing or the health assisting uh, nursing programs uh, that that uh, are, are available in our state um, for approval. Uh, these are cost-effective largely because they don't take major infrastructure changes. 
right? That you, you can use a classroom for these. Really, it takes getting really good people to teach the courses, right? And that's something that, that we feel we can do. Um, and there's such a, um, you know, a, a need for this work. And we think this will reach students that, uh, a broader range of students. So to do this, we got to conduct labor market research with the Mass Higher Workforce Force Board, uh, determine what is the student demand for a new program. And we, then we move to designing, developing uh, uh, the program, the budget, the staffing. Um, we want, as I said before, the, the grants, what are the funding opportunities, some of which we're pursuing right now, um, seeking partnerships in the community. Um, we've got to create the program advisory committees um, with stakeholders from the community that will help us oversee these programs. And then uh, because uh, we're a partner with Essex North Shore, um, we then consult with them also in these programs. Uh, that's part of what the state requires um, as, we, as we look to build and expand. Thank you, James. And so uh, the, you know, so we're talking, if you talk about strengthening and expanding the programs, the, the question is, and, and, and what James just laid out are, it's a lot of work to do that, you know, tremendous opportunity for our, our students and our community to, to, to grow the program and strengthen it. You're seeing that, you know, our enrollment for next year looks very, very positive and very strong. Uh, but, but we can't do it with what we have right now. And to typically to grow anything, you need to invest in it. And so we've been working together, James and I, on, on what would that be like? And a few weeks ago, we presented the, the school committee a likely timeline. So if you think of uh, of, of how to get to the, a new or new programs. Um, if you think of timelines, year zero, whenever that would be, um, but we'll talk about that in a moment, would be approve and fund a new CVTE leadership position, uh, perhaps a 0.5 administrator um, for, for the upcoming, you know, for the year ahead, whenever you budget that. So, um, and, and the reason, um, and then year one is when that position would come into play. Um, and you do necessary background research. That, that person does everything that James has showed you in the previous slide, the background research, the due diligence, uh, identifying staffing, identifying the program, building the program really, okay, uh, in that year. Uh, and they're also, of course, not only building new program, they're, they're working with the existing programs and strengthening them as well uh, through all those same methods. And then year two is when you would, um, you know, have the uh, application and launch process with uh, Department of Education uh, going to a fifth program, fifth chapter 74 program, um, requires us to, um, uh, to hire a full-time administrator. And at that point, I think we would, we would, we would need to, um, with five programs. And that year two is when you think you, uh, you know, take all that background research and due diligence you have and put into action with identifying facilities and getting the equipment, hiring the personnel, developing the program of study and instruction, um, on whatever program or programs we decided to do and then year three students would be enrolled. So we were honestly thinking about um, when we just shared this in, in our timeline um, a few weeks ago was that year zero would be next year. Um, so next year we work to identify funding, you know, for the F for FY, I mean, meaning during FY22, we would be identifying the funding that would start in FY23. So year, think of year one as FY23. Because um, we don't at this point have, have funding in the budget for this upcoming year for this position. Um, and then we'd go from there. You know, so in a few years, we'd have students enrolled. Um, just recently, um, a grant opportunity has, has come up. And James and I are in very preliminary, very, very, very preliminary um, uh, work on that. Um, just really sort of outreach connection, that sort of thing. But there may be a possibility for, for year one to be next year. Um, but that's TBD, certainly. Um, but what we want to do is we see tremendous opportunity here. I mean, I'll just say that um, the work our teachers in, in our career of Oak Tech and our students are doing is, is absolutely the essential work that we want done in, in any high school class. You talk about uh, preparing kids for the future, communication skills, collaboration skills, um, uh, um, uh, you know, t uh, teamwork skills and, and problem solving skills. Those are things that are happening every single day in our, um, in our uh, Vogue Tech programs and also need to happen in all our other, other programs as well. Um, and then if you combine uh, the entrepreneurship and the employability 
uh, programs and skills and, and instruction. Uh, that's a really powerful combination for a kid coming out of high school. Um, and it creates a pathway for them that is just, you know, it's a myriad opportunities. It could be in, in the area they were studying, but it could also, you know, in that employment, employment in that area of concentration they had. It could be a two-year program, a four-year program, but it really just gives our kids who are going through this program just a tremendous pathways for them to select and choose depending on where their skills are, their interests are. And that is not something to sneeze at, you know, that's a really big deal. Um, so we're really confident in the program. We'll, uh, they, we've done a great job strengthening it. We need to continue to strengthen it and grow it. And uh, in order to do that well, we're gonna um, need all of your support um, and the community support ongoing. And I, I think it's there. I think for, since coming to Gloucester, folks have really impressed upon me how important this, this um, uh, uh, the, our CBTE programs are to our students, our community um, at large. So we're excited about um, really continue to dig in together. Um, and uh, just wanna make sure you guys understand both the strength of, of it, but also the opportunity to, to, to move from here. So we'll shut down the presentation and be happy to answer any questions. Um, most of which I will leave to James because he's more knowledge about, knowledgeable about it than I am. All right, thank you, uh, Ben, we appreciate it. Um, Councilor questions, Councilor Holmgren and then Councilor Pett. Uh, not a question really, but more of a comment. I want to thank uh, Principal Cook uh, and um, Superintendent Lummis and the school committee for their initiative and their um, hard work, not to mention all of the teachers uh, in these vocational programs. And I also, well, I guess it is kind of a question. Um, I saw on Facebook today that the North Shore Community College Corporate and Professional Education um, page is advertising for training uh, for a um, metal working skills certificate in CNC milling. Um, and that's in collaboration with North Shore Community College, uh, Gloucester High School, the Gloucester Education Foundation and the North Shore Career Center. And I didn't know how, this might be a big question, but how, what, how this presentation would sort of mesh with that or if it does, but um, regardless, the kids here uh, have exceptional vocational skills and I'm really glad that they have an alternative to um, NSAT, um, although NSAT is terrific as well, but these programs are incredible. And I'm so excited to hear about uh, the uh, LPN um, uh, and home health aid programs. I, I was thinking of you, Jen, when I was saying that, I realized I had a really good audience uh, here for, for that aspect of what, where, we, where, we're, where we're hoping to head, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I would say that, yeah, we're, we're always looking for those uh, partnerships. Um, and you know, rather than uh, competing with uh, NSAT and uh, you know other folks, that we're working with them to make sure our students have, you know, not just the students from Gloucester who go, you know, full time, but uh, but also you know students who might be enrolled here to do what what they call the after dark program there, or or any of these, or using their facilities for other programs like the one you mentioned, um, or using our facilities to partner for some adult education, like I, I had mentioned earlier in our advanced manufacturing area, because those, you know, many of those are our very recent former students who, um, you know, have found whatever employment they have currently is not cutting it, right? And, and they want to up, up, upgrade in, in their training. So, so in general, um, you know, talking about how things fit together with this, it's where we're always looking for those opportunities to partner. And currently the real impediment to even doing more of that is really administrative capacity that we were looking to address in, in what, um, you know, the, the parts that Ben and I presented at the end is making sure that somebody is, is dedicated, um, you know, what can we do to create a position that is really dedicated to, um, you know, not just our chapter 74 programs, but also these kind of partnerships like the one you mentioned. Um, and, and expanding all those pathways and opportunities uh, that that come up, um, you know, especially with all, all that we're all, all, all that we're doing, um, in, you know, COVID or, or otherwise to try to keep all our kids in school. These are very long days for, 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 for the teachers and for the administrative team, because we're really doing the work that in a regional vocational school, they have a couple people who just focus on the partnerships. Right. And the teachers and, and, and I are, we're doing that work in addition to our, our other responsibilities. So, so um, that's, that's how I would answer that question is we're always looking for the partnerships and, and we're making a lot of them happen. Um, and the impediment to doing more of it is the, 
is our administrative capacity, which you saw in the presentation, what we're looking to do to remedy that. And you'll come and, and guest lecture, I hope, Jen, in the, um, in the program. I would be honored. Are you kidding? That would be so cool. So, I so I'm going to remember this when we get there, Jen. I was, Jen, 17, get I was there. a CNA. I was 17 years old when I started as a CNA at Seacoast. I would love to. Tell me anytime. Okay. Thank you. And we got some work to do before then, but I'll keep it in mind. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. Let us know when it happens, Jen. I'd love to be in attendance also. <laughs> All right, uh, Councillor Pat. Yes, um, thank you, uh, um, uh, Principal Cook and uh, Superintendent Loomis um, uh, for these uh, presentations, but um, uh, uh, more importantly for continuing to bring back the uh, vocational uh, education in uh, the Gloucester system. Uh, you know, uh, uh, 50 years ago when, uh, uh, when I graduated from Gloucester High School, you know, we had quite a uh, vocational school and we didn't have, there was North Shore Aggie, but, uh, 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 and then, uh, you know, along came years later was North Shore Voc Tech and uh, everything else. And now uh, NSAT is quite a institution. And I know when, uh, um, uh, when I was working with Senator Tarr, uh, both uh, NSAT and I think the Worcester uh, Technical uh, schools had a lot of um, cooperation and sponsorships um, from businesses that were related. Um, and I know at um, some point, at least in the automotive, I think uh, uh, the Lion War Auto Group has uh, uh, made contributions, significant contributions to the automotive program here. And I'm just wondering if you uh, uh, have ongoing relationships, say, with like Lion War or Sudbury Mo uh, Automotive uh, Group. Um, and also, you know, on the other sides, you know, say an, an electrical or something. I know there was a, uh, at NSAT, they had, I think, Cranny or someone, uh, et cetera. And I'm just wondering if you're, you know, um, if you're continuing to explore um, working together uh, with some of these, um, you know, the businesses themselves and, uh, uh, hopefully being able to bring in things like, you know, equipment and uh, other things or whatever uh, assistance. Yeah, no, absolutely, Barry. So like one of, one of the things that uh, the WA connection, the Lion WA connection has really been vital, uh, essential to the expansion in our auto program. Um, also for employing our kids, to be honest, uh, we were just talking, you know, there's there's an investment too, that there's a benefit on the business side, um, which I was just talking to uh, Jack Porter about today. Um, you know, some of our students who, who are now, you know, in the workforce and um, are, are benefiting the companies that have helped us, right? Um, so yeah, so you no know, new equipment that we've been able to get, um, you know, recent equipment that's, uh, um, uh, storage, uh, we were able to upgrade and, and, and renovate our storage um, through Lion Walk Connection. Um, you know, so, so smaller things like that all the way up to the instructor, the second instructor that we now have is, is through that connection. In electricity, I'll just, you know, I can mention a bunch of things, but I'll just mention in electricity, uh, we also, we work with a, uh, we work with a union um, that are uh, in an apprenticeship um, that, that our, our, our students can um, work with in a connection. Um, and also that um, the construction craft labor program that our students are involved with where they spend time here at Gloucester High School and then go down to NSAP um, for the uh, afternoon and early evening, um, that's also through, through a union, so uh, Local 22. So those are the other, so the business connections and then there are the union connections as well that we cultivate. Um, and we see opportunities to do, to do more of that as well um, with the increased uh, capacity that we're, you know, that I spoke about in answering Jen's question. So it's, that's something that's extremely in, you know, in, important to us. And it is definitely, uh, um, and there, those folks are also, I should mention, are, are all, every program has uh, several um, uh, members of the business community in, the, in that um, trade on the advisory committee. Right, who are advising us about what what we should be doing in 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 the teaching and learning part, and also in the equipment, and 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 also you know just connections for our kids for employment. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Barry. Uh, any other councilor questions, comments, Councilor Gilman? Thank you, Councilor. 
So I've got just a couple of quick things. First of all, so happy to hear that um, Superintendent Lemus and um, Principal Cook are being so proactive with the um, outreach to the eighth graders at O'Malley. So good for you. It's exciting to see. It's so important. Thank you. I have a question on the needs assessment in terms of how we determine that the two courses that we think are most prevalent if we were to be able to develop uh, an additional CVTE leadership position being nursing, practical nursing or health assistance. Like how did we choose that? Do we do a needs assessment locally with businesses to learn what they really need? Um, I'm just eager to, to learn about that. I, I know that the nurse, the health assistant program is the fourth most popular at NSAT right now. Um, this, I believe last, or this year's class is 70 in that. So it is popular, but I'm, I'm really eager to find out how you determine that those two are next on deck. So those were just the, the examples that we've explored so far. So un unfortunately, the initial exploration and discussions with DESI about the, so it's a long process to get a, a program approved. So yeah. um, the initial discussions with, which go back uh, before Ben, um, a, long, a, long, a little long before Ben, really, uh, in terms of months anyway, um, with these conversations about how do we get going? What is ground, what is, what is year zero look like? What is year one? And year yeah. That year one includes the, the needs assessment that you're talking about, right? So okay. we, we've done preliminary work around including looking at at NSET, what are the popular programs, looking at, um, you know, the mass hire at, right, our regional needs and to come up with some preliminary ideas. So we're not just shooting all over the place with, you know, whole, all, all the different programs. There's so many programs. Yeah. So, um, However, we, it, we, it's not that we've decided on those, it's just those are examples that would okay. both meet our initial exploration of needs that exist um, in our region and are popular uh, you know, nearby. Right, it, it, right. It gives us a place I'm, to I'm not, start. I'm not saying that think. they're not really important ones for sure. Right. You know, just realizing. No, but you're right that, that, that we haven't like closed off other yeah. possibilities okay. to be clear. I guess that's the clear, the short answer is, yeah. yeah, we haven't closed off the others. Those are just the initial uh, places we've looked so far. Great. And um, if it's okay, Council LeBlanc, may I ask a second question? Yep, go ahead, Council. Thank you. My second question is, I'm just intrigued, or uh, in inquisitive to find out what the challenges have been and continue to be with getting the students up to NSAT for the CCL, um, the construction craft laborers um, union group. Um, because I know last year we, we, we had some extra funding from a, a, a community uh, mm -hmm. donation and um, a I know that we had a couple of hurdles, but I think you got over those, but I, I'm just eager to find out how easy it is to get our students up there. And if not, what some of the things are that you're thinking of to improve that ease, because I think that program is phenomenal and I love to see the partnership and being the, the rep for Gloucester and NZAT, I, I get involved hearing about this a lot and I'm always rooting for this program to be successful. Yeah. Um, so if you could just share with us um, some sure. of your thoughts on that, that would be true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, um, we were able to overcome the hurdles that co about assemblies and the kinds of things we did to get the initial, we usually do with our vocational programs. We, we seem to have overcome those with the video that we created for O'Malley. Like it seems to have worked out, right? Um, and the other outreach we did um, and their counselors working with kids and, you know, all that partnership. We, we're partnered, we're, in fact, another email today from the coordinator from NSAT, um, we just haven't been able to break through. It's not so much the transportation or those issues, it's getting the kids willing to leave a, our school for you know, half the day and, and spend that time on the bus down and back. And um, it, there's some in-person um, experiences, Val, that like, or seeing something or, or, or um, that, that we just haven't been able to replicate. I remember the thing that really hit with the CCL program was there, there, were, there were kids who were like, ah, they were like getting ready to bail out. This is the first batch of kids who did two years, who graduated last year. Mm -hmm. So those students, 
they, you know, some of the kids were, oh, my, it's, it, it's a hassle. It takes a lot of time. And then they went on their first field trip, right? They went to a high rise in Boston that the construction craft laborers were working on. And it just knocks the kids out. They were like, I want to do this is good. I'm staying. This is what I, you know, I'm, I'm here. Right. And that's kind of experiential kind of thing is what we're hoping we can't do it this year and and we we haven't uh been able to last spring and this spring convince more kids that you're right to take these opportunities but in partnering with nsat on our our can we replicate some of the experiential things that we know work for kids and can um can we um, have some of those in-person sit-down meetings with families that we did two and three years ago, like when we got our first batch, it, it takes a lot of work to convince people to invest the time into this opportunity because it's unusual. And because it does take time away from, you know, uh, from Gloucester, right? From, from, from their families, it's a, it's a longer day for kids. Um, you really need to have the family behind it, pushing and, and, and supporting. And, um, and, and, you know, we are, kids like to stay on the island or what have you, right? I mean, in some way, right? To be part of the high school experience, to be, you know, uh, all of those things. And you do lose some of that when you go in. The CCL program though, does a great job of creating an identity for the kids who are part of that. Like really creates a sense of they're a team, right? They get the jackets and the, you know, the, the shirts and the, these events that they do together. So it's just getting that to be convincing to kids to take that opportunity. Um, we, we haven't been able to over, like in COVID times, we haven't been able to overcome that, but um, we actually had the idea in, in Val, I'll tell you that what we shared with NSAT yesterday was the idea, like, could you guys do a video for us? Right, like that, right? Like we, that seems to have worked here. And we did, we asked, cause we can't do it. Cause we're not there on site to, 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 to show the cool things. So we, we sent a request yesterday um, and by we, this is uh, Laura Carlson, our um, head of guidance and I mm -hmm. uh, reached out to make a request to see if they could, even if it's informal and just some kids going around with a camera to see some of the cool activities uh, on, on campus that they're able to do to replicate the, 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 the large construction sites in the CCL program. So hopefully that'll, we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Great, thank you so much, appreciate right. it. Thank you, Val. Any other councilor questions? All right, and before I turn it over to Chairman Pope, I just want to, um, I don't have any questions, but I just want to say, that, um, you know, recognize the school committee and the schools for um, Gloucester High School and Principal Pope, or I mean, Principal um, Cook, for all the great work with the vocational schools. Um, you know, some of us don't go to college, some of us don't go, you know, some of us go into the service, some of us do a bunch of different things. After high school, um, I'm in the trades. Councilor O'Hara is in the trades. Councilor Nolan is in the trades. Um, we live on a small island, and it's and it's remarkable that you look around and see how many small businesses have been pumped out of the high school from these vocational programs, um, and they they succeed. So, um, you know, kudos to you guys and to, to keep pumping them out because not not everybody's suited for college, but you can earn a very good living in the trades and. Uh, you know, coming out of Gloucester High School and working for myself for many, many years, um, it, it's it's proven, and you know, it's it's a it's a feel good moment to look around and see all these young kids coming out into the workforce, uh, ready to take on the world. So, good for you guys, and it's good for the city. So, appreciate it. And then uh, I'll hand it over to Chairman Pope. Uh, thank you, Council President. Um, are there any questions from the um, school committee? We've had this presentation recently, but. Laura. I, I want to firstly just say thank you. I have heard this presentation before there was, but the new numbers of, uh, of enrollment, that was new. And that's, that's really great news. So kudos and great video, I guess. Um, my question is, I know you talked about the half time um, person. And then if you have a fifth, a fifth CVTE course, you'll need a full-time administrator. Is the vision that that person would sort of transition into a full-time administrator or are those totally separate posts? Do you know what I mean? Uh, no, not, I mean. So you're talking about hiring a half-time person to research and put into place the potential oh, yeah, of a fifth yeah, program. Yeah, 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 yes, yes. So yes, the answer would be yes, because uh, half-time as, as you build, but um, as you know, Presumably, we would be doing a fifth chapter 74 program, 
And, I, and, I, you know, and, um, and one of the requirements for that is that you have a full-time administrator. And at that point, we really would need one. Um, you know, the administrative support of the high school is, is, very, is very limited at this point and less than it has been in the past. Um, and because of that, you know, uh, James does a fantastic job of, you know, pulling pieces here and there to keep things, you know, really uh, on schedule and operational and, and, and growing. And I, I don't mean just CBTE, but I mean like the whole school, right? So you, you couldn't build the new program, research, I'll do all the due diligence with, with, with just what we have now. So th hence the, the, the part-time, the half-time FTE. And then to go fully, you would really need a full-time person, absolutely. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the school committee? Okay, seeing none, um, uh, we'll move on to our uh, presentation on traffic. Um, and uh, I am going to take that. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. I don't know, I haven't done this before, but um, I don't know why I have that stuff on the side. There we go. All right, um, so we're gonna, I, we, we're gonna concentrate on three schools, um, East Gloucester, Veterans, and, um, and West Parish. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna get rid of this. Uh, um, so at East Gloucester, uh, on, which is on Davis Street Extension, only buses are allowed onto Davis Street Extension um, at dismissal. Chapel Street is one way from Main Street to Davis Street and Mount Pleasant is, uh, and, and from Mount Pleasant to Davis Street. So all the um, car traffic is funneled into Davis Street and then exits through Davis Street onto Highland. Um, parts, uh, Seem, there seems to be enough parking in the um, neighborhood legally uh, for parents to park their car and to walk in and um, uh, uh, pick up their, their students. Um, so the, the buses, there are two big buses and one small bus that arrive at East Gloucester. Um, the uh, smaller bus is from Pathways and takes Pathways and, and, and YMCA. The two larger buses um, cannot make the turn. So they have to come in and, and do a three point turn in order to get um, in, in line to be able to pull out. Uh, no students are allowed out into the area while the buses are uh, moving around. Um, they then load the buses. Um, all the walkers are held back until the buses are loaded and, and gone. And then the walkers are released. Um, there's a crossing guard at the intersection of Davis and, and um, the chapel. And um, there are also um, a number of uh, students who actually exit um, through the playground and up a path up to uh, Mount Pleasant Avenue. And uh, some parents actually park up there. Um, uh, there's, uh, doesn't seem, it seems to be a system that works uh, relatively well. And uh, it by um, 240, um, everything is clear and uh, it goes back to uh, normal. Veterans, uh, the dismissal time is at 2.30 and there are more problems at, at veterans. Um, there's a pathways bus that arrives um, about 10 minutes um, before um, uh, students uh, leave, uh, are dismissed. Um, it parks, you can see where it's parked there, but it's basically right across from where there is legal parking on the other side of the street. And um, what that does is it causes um, a one lane bottleneck um, there. So uh, cars coming up the street have to um, uh, sort of navigate uh, onto the other side of the street to get by. 
um, and, and the visibility is not great, um, but uh, it, 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 there's not a lot of traffic either. Um, when I observed it, there was, it was, um, there was only one point where there were two cars backed up behind the pathways bus. Um, the uh, parents arrive. Um, I will say that Veterans has a great deal of walkers and um, there's the one bus, there's the one small bus that parks on um, Webster Street, but the uh, larger bus um, arrives beforehand. It um, goes up Webster Street and then backs into the, um, the driveway. Um, and uh, once again, uh, there are no students allowed out until while these um, operations are happening. Um, there's then uh, the smaller bus um, comes and parks onto Webster Street. Um, the problem is that there's no real parking. Um, so what you see here, um, I know it's kind of small, but you can see somebody pulling into the handicapped parking spot and getting out. And then just below that, you see a black pickup truck turning around and parking on the sidewalk. So that in itself is a problem. Um, and uh, also where these cones are right in here, um, people will also park there as, the, uh, as it moves on. Um, so when the students are dismissed, um, the, um, the, the, to let the students onto the buses, they have to uh, flash their uh, red blink blinking lights, which stops traffic altogether on Webster Street. Um, the students release the, the bus students release first, um, and uh, then uh, and then the walkers are released. Um, uh, um, the day that I was there, I don't know if this is a regular um, procedure, but uh, a police cruiser or did arrive, um, and the officer got out and uh, served as a crossing guard up towards Friend Street. Um, all this being said, um, by uh, two thirty-seven, um, everything was everybody was gone. So, once again, it was just a very short period of time. Um, uh, West Parish, West Parish gets out at three o'clock. I arrived there at two thirty-five. Uh, with 25 minutes to uh, before dismissal and there were 15 to 20 cars already in the queue uh, to pick up students. Um, at about 2.50, 10 minutes before um, uh, school um, was really uh, got, uh, dismissal was um, happened, um, the um, the um, the queue um, got to the point where it was filling um, the uh, site, the school site, and cars were starting to back up onto Concord Street. Um, the queue on site holds uh, 50 to 58 cars, depending on how big they are and how much space people leave between them. So um, as the queue um, uh, forms, uh, the st uh, staff member goes out and um, gets a list of the um, students that they're picking up. Every car has a um, placard on the, beginning, on the dashboard of the car that states which students are going to be picked up and that they're picking up. And that the staff member then goes back and gives that information, the order of uh, pickup to the um, uh, school secretary, who then releases the students in that order, um, as well as the uh, pathways in it, YMCA bus, um, a special education bus, and the first bus. So they load 10 cars at a time, and they release uh, students for the first 10 cars, and the first buses, 
and then um, once they have left, they um, they go to the um, the next bus and the um, and this second group of ten cars. So they're doing they're loading ten cars at a time. All of the, their their staff there um, uh, at all points um, at the uh, at the entrance to the bus uh, loop, as well as uh, escorting students out and making sure they get into the right cars. Um, there are very few walkers at West Parish, um, and um, there were uh, very few, but a couple of people uh, still park illegally um, and um, off-site and uh, come and pick up um, their students. There's actually there's no legal parking in the area. So once um, the students once the the students are starting to be being loaded. Um, it actually um, works quite well, um, as you can see, that the uh, cars leave, they take a right turn onto Concord Street, the cars come in um, from the other side, and there's, um, it moves rather, rather well and rather smoothly. Um, and um, at uh, by 310, um, the queue is gone and uh, everybody is uh, everybody's on their way. So um, that's that's how we handle it. Now, um, we only have control of what we can do on the site. We can't um, uh, we, we can't control the, the streets, but the um, conditions that were put in at West Parish um, work um, as well as can be expected. Um, so be between the 55 odd cars that are on the, in the queue on the site, I would suggest that there were probably another 20 to 25 on Concord Street, um, which is, a, and, and I've heard and I've been told that on rainy days, which uh, as you can see, it was a nice day that I, I took those pictures, um, there are more cars. Um, the problem is that uh, the West Parish uh, district is very large and this year, um, as you know, um, at the beginning of the year, we could only um, transport about 20 to 22 kids on one of those great big 65 person buses. Uh, which necessitated us to limit uh, student, uh, transporting students, uh, only those students that live two miles away or greater. And um, so that increased the, the car traffic immensely because as I said, there are not a lot of walkers um, that, um, in the area of West Parish. Um, the, the school committee has, um, had um, preliminary discussions about what, how we can increase bus ridership the next year. Um, we have uh, thought about um, uh, eliminating all fees. Um, we're not sure how that would play out. Um, we would have to um, put some conditions on that as to, um, because if we have to add buses, it would be a substantial um, expense. The loss of the fees is not a substantial expense, but um, but the, if we have to add buses, um, it would be uh, financially not re not responsible. So we we'd have to figure out what the limit, uh, the distance limit, and the safety limits would be uh, for trans transporting um, everybody free. And then we're also not sure that um, that people will take it up. And what what we hear a lot of is um, that, well, you know, my kids goes to softball practice or, or, or violin lessons or, or whatever it is, uh, or he's gonna go stay, uh, is taken care of by um, uh, somebody else. So we, we have to uh, figure out how to make accommodations uh, as best we can for, so that we can reach the, 
the most number of um, students um, to and encourage riding the bus, but it's also a cultural thing. And uh, we, we are gonna need help um, um, throughout the city um, to convince people that riding the bus is, is, is the way to go. Um, one bus full of kids eliminates 32 cars, um, driving kids. So that's our goal. Um, how we can make the um, what? How we can make uh, the dismissal um, pickup easier? Um, we're open to uh, suggestions, but uh, we have uh, been working at this for a while, and, and we have uh, uh, programs that work. You know, that work pretty well. And we're talking about um, about a twenty-minute period um, at West Parish. Um, where there's traffic issues on Concord Street. Uh, at dismissal, there's not a lot of problems at arrival. Um, at, uh, at veterans, it's about um, 10 minutes where there are traffic issues. And at East Gloucester, um, um, I didn't observe any um, situations where people were, were um, held up or delayed for any long period of time. So. With that said, um, I'd like to open it up for a discussion. All right, uh, I'll ask the city council first. Do we have any questions on the traffic? Uh, council Holmgren. I, again, I don't have any questions, but uh, we are in the West Parish drop off and pick up line uh, every day. And we did it because of COVID. Uh, we did send our daughter via the bus, but, uh, we thought that um, since we do have the ability to drive her, we will, but it's, um, they've done, the, the staff at West Parish and Dr. Emmo have done an absolutely remarkable job in helping people stay safe, uh, educating people on the best things to do uh, to navigate that time of day. Uh, they're communicating as best they can. Um, and uh, I, I have no complaints. I completely agree um, with the idea of more people riding the bus. I rode the bus all through high school. Um, it's uh, economically and um, well, um, environmentally friendly uh, to do it and uh, maybe not economically friendly, but I, I hope that we can figure something out. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Any other council questions, Councilor Gilman? Thank you. Um, Jonathan and, and um... Superintendent Lummis, have you ever done any best practices in terms of what um, other cities and towns are doing to encourage people to take the bus as opposed to being, being driven in, like programs, incentives, whatever, things that we could all put our arms around to think a little bit in terms of, does that make sense, something we could try? Yeah, um, I'll actually call on Kathy. I think maybe you want to respond to this. Uh, Kathy, Clancy and I have been have met with um, Safe Routes to Schools, which is a you know tremendous re a statewide resource on access at, um, to schools, arrival and dismissal, improving the um, you know the operations of that, and then also really building up both uh, folks you know walking, riding bikes, and taking the bus. So, but Kathy, do you want to um, you know characterize some of the what we've learned and what we can continue to do. Yeah, so um, uh, the Safe Routes to Schools actually, you know, commented on the plan for the new school um, and they liked, uh, you know, the separate entrances that we had. Um, they say that a lot of communities have issues with making the bus cool to ride again, right? I mean, I think <clears throat> everybody's so used to bringing, um, to bringing their kids everywhere. Um, and then they complain about traffic or the community complains about traffic. But, you know, one point they made was that you are the traffic, right? So if we can try to educate parents that if you want less traffic, there are ways to get your child to school. Um, you know, one is the bus. Um, hopefully for some of the schools where kids can walk or, um, or bike or, you know, do parent supervised walking groups, um, that you know, meet up elsewhere. Um, those are some options that they talked about there. They do have some education programs that we're gonna start to talk about in the fall after things get back to a little more normal time, um, just so we can 
start shifting the culture and the mindset. We all heard loud and clear the uproar about, you know, styrofoam trays at West Parish, yet West Parish has probably the highest percentage of parents that drop their kids off and pick them up pre-COVID. Um, so, you know, this whole consistent thing of trying to be energy efficient, environmentally friendly, um, safety. Um, we want to make sure that the whole message is that safety is our community's responsibility, not just the schools. So, you know, what do we do as a community to help our kids get to and from school safely? But yeah, so we are definitely using them as a resource for best practices. And, and, and any good campaign needs a good slogan. So we coined uh, the go yellow to go green, um, yeah. you know, hearkening to the yeah. environmental I aspect. Love so that. that. <laughs> I, I, I will take credit, Kathy, can, can I take credit for that? Yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, go yellow, go green. That's awesome. Uh, Councilor Gilman, you got another question? Yeah, it's a quick question. But as the Ward 4 counselor, I was just wondering why we didn't do a similar traffic study to Plum Cove and Beeman Memorial. Um, it was just the time constraints. I, you know, we... Um, I don't have, we don't have staff to go out and do that. So basically um, uh, that was done by, um, by Kathy and I, those okay. that PowerPoint. So. And, and, and just to, I, I can add something because I, I've been, been in both, witnessed both um, numerous times. The uh, Plum Cove approach is very similar to West Parish this year um, where they have a, you know, a queue that's backing up onto the neighborhood street there. But for a limited amount of time, it's very well organized. Um, you know, once it gets rolling, it, it, it goes quite well. They're calling in the names, you know, the, the uh, families have placards on their car windows, that sort of thing. So it's very comparable to, I mean, the approach is comparable to West Parish. And then the Beeman approach is comparable to um, the vet, vets in East Gloucester, which is a little more ad hoc. You know, mm -hmm. um, one of the major complications at Beeman are getting the buses in and out. Um, they've done this year is, um, is uh, they've limited that, parking lot and drive area just to the buses, but mm -hmm. still with, um, you know, that, that's just a, it's, it's, it's a, that's their, their major, you know, challenge. Um, Laura Weeson, you're in there a lot. You're welcome to um, have experienced that, like um, Council Holmgren has experienced West Parish, but uh, that's a, that is a challenging one, just like the, the other two older schools as well. Yeah, Val, I can just say something about the Beeman um, experience, which is that there is no pickup, right? Cars don't go up and through. That is reserved for buses. Um, it's um, I, maybe because there's more space. I mean, parents park. Either they park and wait for their kids or they park and go in uh, or go up. Um, and they do let the walkers out first and then call the buses. So it's a little bit different. The you know I can hear the message. They you know there's classes dismissed. They let the walkers out. You know I'm where the a lot of the kindergartners are. So there's parents. You know there's parents waiting, mm -hmm. who are parked. So no one goes directly into a car. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a little more ad hoc. But it, it doesn't. It feels it feels quite safe as yeah. a parent. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Val. Any other council questions, Council Holmgren? I, I have one more comment if, if no other counselors uh, want to weigh in. Okay, I just want to give a shout out to Councillor Nolan, who's been working with Mass Highway and uh, Senator Tarr on making the surrounding area uh, on 133 um, a little bit safer, uh, including hopefully advocating for uh, more lighting, better sidewalks, etc. So thanks, Councillor Nolan. Thank you, Jen. Um, so I have a quick question. Um, Councilor we were, Harris, uh, Councilor Harris got his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, Jamie. And, 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 and also a school committee member, um, Watson. Go ahead, Steve. You, you talk first. All right. I, so we, we got an, we received an email earlier, um, today about West Parish, um, cars going over the lane. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not just at West Paris. It happens down the boulevard at the drawbridge. It happens behind trash trucks. I mean, it happens all over the city, um, to be honest with you. But, you know, when somebody, when a constituent reaches out and says they almost got uh, in a, in a head-on collision with somebody, and I know the school committee and, you know, the DPW or whatever can't control what people are going to do, but um, is there any way to try to curb that um, kind of activity over at West Paris? Because 
you got you got a blind corner on several of those areas over there. And I know I know you don't have the answer for it. I just wanted to bring it up because that person did email us this this afternoon, and I want to make sure that we brought it up for our discussion tonight that it was uh, yeah. made, made aware of. Thank you, um, Council President LeBlanc. So I saw that video as well, and you know one thing I noticed. I mean, listen, we don't want those cars backing up off the queue as we saw tonight, you know, for those 10 or 15 minutes, 10, 10 20 minutes onto, onto um, Concord Avenue. That, that is an ideal in any way, shape or form, you know, it's a tough situation uh, that, you know, that, that we're in, right? All of us are in. What I did notice, and, 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 I, and I hope this is the case, but in that video, for example, you know, what I noticed was the cars were being very careful and, and being, you know, and moving slowly. And that's what you need to do, obviously, when you run into a tough traffic situation. Um, but I don't, I, I don't know what the answer is. You know, the, you know, the, I, my understanding in, in the design process for West Parish was that there was a really tough choice to make around the softball field there, um, you know, um, or not. And, and you know, that, that's a choice that was made. I think the, the good part for us on this one is, you know, we've learned in terms of, you know, the queue at West, at, at veterans will be longer, you know, Almost double the size of the one at 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 uh, at at um at uh sorry at, at West Parish. Parish. Yeah. So so that's that's one way you learn, of course. But um, I'm we're open to ideas. You know, yeah. if it's better traffic control, if it's one way during certain times, like we've done at East East Gloucester. But um, but happy to open ideas, Council Homerin. I think you, you know I saw your hand up. You, you experience every day. Do you have any thoughts or what? What can you share what you've seen? Well, I, I unfortunately didn't see that. Um, my husband did pick up today and uh, I wasn't aware of that email either. So that's really unfortunate. Um, I mean, it, it, the, uh, the perennial more signage uh, might help, but I know that that's an expense. Uh, it's um, it, it, putting signs up strategically. Um, and I, I think uh, by and large, unfortunately, I mean, we, we can't control accidents. Uh, and, and we can only do our best. And um, I, I've seen uh, parents and uh, guardians be very considerate of each other. Um, uh, the teachers are constantly watching out, um, constantly standing there, uh, going the extra mile to make sure that the traffic is moving, that people are being safe. Um, and uh, I, I unfortunately don't really, um, but I, I'm really happy that uh, there was no accident. Yeah, it was. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, yeah. Just it was a slow. You know, um, it was just showed what happens when cars who aren't in the queue, you know, going the same direction as the queue, trying to get around it. You know, and, and there wasn't. It wasn't an accident and like and like that. But it showed. You know, the car coming cars moving out of the way, um, going slowly, as I said. But it's definitely. I mean, it's not ideal. I don't want to. I don't want to explain it away. I don't want to. Uh, you know, um, diminish it. Um, it's a real challenge. To, to, right. and, um, and and that happens. You know, um, around school sites, um, you know, in different ways, uh, and it's always a struggle for those, you know, fifteen or, you know, ten, fifteen or twenty minutes. It always is, and 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 I think the good news for Gloucester is we continue to learn how to how to do it better. You know, so with the new school, East Gloucester veterans, that's going to be transformational for if you take those two sites, which are very much ad hoc right now, and where Webster Street goes down to one lane. You know, so um, that's looking forward, obviously. Um, to what we've learned from West Parish. And, and I think it'll be quite a bit better, honestly, as, as we've explained to you in our April meeting. Great. Thank you. Uh, Council O'Hara. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for um, Superintendent Loomis and uh, Council, uh, School Committee President Jonathan Pope for presenting tonight. Um, I've, I've been at West Parish and actually I've put in numerous requests to the mayor. Um, this year has been, or this past winter, along with the pandemic and a rather mild winter, I think we've, we've kind of forgotten what a real winter was, has, has been like. And uh, with snow banks at, on Concord Street and as Council Blank has mentioned the blind Corn is particularly heading up towards um, the fire station. I have had complaints from constituents of potential head-on collisions um, coming from the cars in the queue lining up 
on Concord Street heading up towards the fire station again, a car heading towards um, Wing of Chic Beach, if you will, from Essex Ave, and then a car heading in the opposite direction, heading towards Essex Ave from the fire station that crosses over the middle, middle lane uh, because of the cars in the queue. Uh, it's a very dangerous situation. And I, uh, everything costs money and, and you're right, traffic does exist. Manchester, if you go over to the Manchester schools during release, they have a traffic issue on Lincoln Street on both schools. Um, way no different. And I, I, I think, you know, it's unfortunate, but I, I don't think the, and I'm not trying to be smart, but the answer is I can't be, I don't know what to do. I think we have to come up with corrective action. Um, it's just, you know, you, you hate to, hate to be, you know, Stephen Ross Bridge over, over uh, in towards Ward 4 is constructed after an unfortunate event happens. Um, I think we've got to be proactive and address the issues that we know. Um, veterans, I, I, I'm very concerned. Um, there is, uh, Mr. Pope has mentioned uh, the, the problem is for 10 or 15 minutes, but there is a problem. We double the, the capacity of the school, we're doubling the traffic. And I, I'm extremely concerned. Um, you know, 440 students, numbers have been thrown out. 60 to 70% of the students are picked up. Uh, at 60%, that equates to 264 cars. Uh, you have a queue of 90 or it, it's, it's, it's a moving target. First it was 78, now it's 90. Um, just to give you an idea of, as I think uh, Mr. Pope's video of West, West Parish showing the cars turning into the entrance from Concord Street, there's probably 20 feet as the queue is moving, there's probably 20 feet between cars that are moving. Um, you throw out, I'm looking at numbers, just 60% of 440 students, that's 264 cars. Um, you throw 30 feet between cars, that's 6,600 feet. Just to give you an idea, from Blackburn, from Blackburn Circle to Grant Circle is, is uh, approximately a mile and a quarter. 6,600 feet is a mile and a quarter. I, 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 don't, I don't want to, you know, we have, I think we have an elephant in the room, so to speak. And, you know, it's not a mistake until it's built. And we're looking at a problem. Uh, Mr. Um, you know, the Traffic Commission, um, very well respected. We, we, the council, go to them on traffic issues. Um, they know this, the city better than anyone. They've spoken up. I don't think we can turn our backs to, to we have a congested neighborhood in the Webster Street area, Webster Street, Eastern Ave, um, Friends Street, it's congested already. We double the student population and we're just looking at major problems. And again, I think we've, 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 been, we've been fortunate we had the mild winter, the pandemic and numbers are down. And um, you know, we, have a serious, we have an average winter. Um, the DPW does a tremendous job. Mike Hale does a tremendous job with the equipment he has. He's always fighting for more equipment. Uh, he has the ability to do more, but he doesn't have the equipment. Um, I, I just think we really need to sit down and, and look at, at the traffic issue, particularly you know, the West Parish. I think we need to correct it and um, we need to address the potential issue at, uh, at, on Webster Street at the potential new school. Uh, thank you very much for your time.
Thank you, Jamie. Um, Chairman Pope, before we have one of your school committee members, do you mind if I follow up with that or Councilor O'Hara? Go right ahead. Um, so, you know, um, Jamie, I, I wish we had the answer. Um, if you know what it is, let us know. We have traffic all over the city. Um, you know, I said this at a last meeting, our city was built on horse and buggies um, roads. That's what, that's what we're, we're dealing with. You know, back in the day when these schools were built, uh, they were built where we were lucky to have maybe one car in a family. Um, now we have several cars per household. So the traffic is, is a major problem no matter where we go. Like you said, in Manchester, um, you know, these schools were built so long ago in the neighborhoods. Um, that's, where, that's where they're at. And um, regardless of how many cars are going through there, there's gonna be traffic. And, um, you know, if we had a magic wand or we had the solution for it, I'm sure that one of us would step up and try to figure this out. Um, as, as we move forward, it's just gonna be a trial by basis process and try to figure the right solution out for each, indi each individual area is a individual problem that we need to solve and we need to figure out the, the corrective action to um, alleviate traffic, which like I said, if one of us has the magic potion that we can find out what it is, um, that'd be great, but we have to see what we have to do. Like I said, everybody's got several cars. I've got four in my family. When I went to, pre when I went to uh, um, you know, grade school, I don't even think we had a car until I was, you know, a preteen or whatever. Um, we, we walked around, so there isn't, there isn't a perfect solution for this. There isn't the right answer, you know, and I want to give uh, kudos to the school committee for, you know, trying everything we possibly can to alleviate the traffic, um, you know, but there, there is no solution, simple solution to this. So um, that being said, I'll hand it back over to Chairman Pope. I, I would just like to um, uh, contest uh, uh, Councilor O'Hara's numbers, um, the 440 students um, uh, doesn't equate to uh, 260 cars. Um, there will be buses. Um, we won't be in a pandemic. And um, the numbers you're using uh, of 60% of the kids coming, being picked up by cars, I, I would tend to think is not accurate. We don't have we have 360 kids at uh, West Parish and we get about 75 or 80 cars. Um, so it's clear that a lot of those cars are picking up more than one child. So that being said, um, uh, you, uh, Councilor Pett has his hand up and uh, but Samantha uh, Watson has had her hand up the whole time. So if I can wait up. until after. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, Thank you, Sam. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I understand what uh, Council O'Hara is saying. And yes, there are issues. Um, but um, the issues are not solved, first of all, by the school uh, committee or the school department. Uh, they do not control uh, what is going on off you know, off of the school grounds. Uh, that's all of us working together uh, to come up with solutions um, in this uh, changing world. And um, there's often, um, as has been discussed, this feedback, like we talked about, uh, uh, say, environmental and uh, disposable items at West Parish, and yet, you know, it's the most, you know, most cars, you know, per school, et cetera. Um, in trying to address some of the um, traffic issues, uh, even around veterans, and this is before I came on the council, um, a number of suggestions were made about changing, you know, street directions, uh, whether it be Friend Street or, you know, whatever. Um, and yet the uh, uh, residents, um, you know, uh, rebelled and said, no, we can't do this. Uh, and yet here are the same, some of the same people are complaining. So it's just a question, as um, Council President uh, LeBlanc stated, uh, is we have to work together to try to come up with the best solutions. 
and um, if we need to on the city side, you know, put more um, more into specific traffic things, and that's what we need to do. Um, but we can't sit here and just point fingers at people. We have to work together um, for the best um, solution to be able to educate our kids and the generations of kids um, to come. Thank you, Barry. Samantha? Thank you. Um, so just in relation to the West Parish traffic um, and the videos that were sent around, the more that I think about how we frame the traffic conversation, the more that I think about the fact that it's not the traffic that's actually dangerous, it's people making sort of poor decisions to cross center lines to avoid the traffic, right? So um, it, I think we really need to think about this as, okay, it's 10 minutes. Are there more, can we put signage up that says school dismissal time between three and, you know, 3.15, please find an alternate route. And I say that because I live in Magnolia. I often have to go through Manchester to get to the highway. And I know when school dismissal is and I avoid it as much as I possibly can because it's just as bad as West Parish, right? So I've learned my behavior has changed because I know that it's, it's dangerous because people do cross the center line to avoid it. And so I think, you know, I think we really need to just look at the whole picture and think about how can we make sure that everybody's informed that school dismissal is at this time? And if you don't want to sit in 15 minutes of traffic, find an alternate route. That's your choice. And so, I, I, you know, I, I want to be careful to continue to, I don't want to keep framing school traffic as the problem. It's, that's not necessarily the problem. Um, we have beach traffic. We have, we have plenty of traffic in this town. We're not advocating to shut down beaches because of beach traffic, right? So like, what can we do? What are the solutions that we can come up together to sort of solve these issues? Um, and it, it really just takes a collective effort, just like Councillor Pet said. Um, and I think it's also about just changing behavior um, in, in the neighborhoods. The second thing I will say is I understand the concerns at veterans, but you know, as long as I'm on the committee, I'm gonna continue to advocate for a downtown school location. I think it's imperative. And no matter where we put a school in downtown Gloucester, there's going to be traffic issues. And so we really do need to just think about this holistically um, and with our you know, problem solving caps on because you know, the downtown families absolutely need a school and anywhere you put a school in this town, there's gonna to be traffic issues. So thank you. Good job, Sam. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Anyone else? We have one more um, topic um, and I will uh, be, uh, we had recently uh, reviewed our long-term capital planning at uh, BNF and I'm going to um, uh, let our BNF chair um, introduce this, uh, so Kathy. You're muted. <laughs> okay, so we, as you know, as part of our annual budget process for a long time, we put forward um, what used to be dreams in our capital plan. And we would say we need this and this and this and this. And, you know, we really never really had the optimistic view that we'd actually get a response or, or get any of those things because of the city's finances at the time. Um, not because there wasn't a need and not because people didn't recognize it, but because it was just difficult for the city to finance them. But given the, um, you know, really strong fiscal management over time, um, you know, Mike Hale with the DPW and John Dunn, on, you know, as a CFO, we've really seen tremendous improvement all across and huge investments. We, um, of course, have West Parish and, you uh, we all think it's perfect, regardless of, of a lengthy traffic discussion. Um, and the Newell Stadium, uh, this past summer, the high school gym finally got the floor repaired and people are thrilled. No one's barely played on it, but let me tell you, they are thrilled to have a real functioning gym. Um, things that you don't see like HVAC systems that 
have been updated and cleaned and, and things that just, you know, everybody wants to see progress, but sometimes progress is not seen. Um, it's like putting a roof on your house. You know you did and you know it was necessary and it's pretty to you, but I'm not sure anybody's gonna compliment your new roof. Um, and, you know, we've worked with the MSBA on different projects and we're grateful for their repair program for the roofs and for some help with windows at the, at the high school. Um, so I guess I just wanna leave this off by saying, you know, now we are, you know, putting forth plans that actually have gotten done. Um, they fit in with DPW maintenance plan. We work with the city on funding and, um, and we like to work with you and getting your support on these pro um, projects. And we're very grateful for that. So um, Ben is gonna go over what, um, what we're doing, but this summer, I think we'll all be pretty pleased. You know, another project um, this summer, which is big is new entryways at both middle and the high school for, um, that are being done for clear sight lines and for safety you know, things that have been literally on our, on our radar screen for a long time is coming to fruition. So um, turn it over to Ben, who's got the presentation. Now he's muted. <laughs> it's incredible. We never learn, right? Um, thank you, Kathy. So let me just get the people out of the way so I can look at the presentation. Um, so uh, I'll give you sort of what I'm hoping to do is uh, start with our goals here about our capital planning. And, um, you know, Kathy said, get things on the radar. And I think that's, the, that's, a, that's an apt, um, I guess, metaphor. In the sense that we wanna make sure um, the school committee, um, the schools themselves, but also the city council and the mayor and other city leaders are, are really well aware of um, one that I think we're going through a, a, a pretty good and productive planning process, but that will happen every year. And we will be able to, um, you know, list out and plan for over the long term um, to, so we can uh, you know, build in the city's master plan just about the facilities because we certainly understand that um, you know, that there are many needs um, around the city and, and, and we need to be a uh, part of that and, and want to be good partners in that. So as we continue our capital planning and as, as I work with um, the city, um, uh, both uh, Mike Hale and the city treasurer, uh, John Dunn, you know, our work is about their goal on this capital planning effort, which like I said, will be ongoing every year. It'll be done every year and revisited annually, is first and foremost to make sure we're providing high quality facilities that support high quality instruction, student learning, engagement and achievement. Uh, secondly, that we wanna work with um, and, and, we, and plan to maximize our facility lifespans and building infrastructure. And you do that primarily, just like you do with your home, through regular and ongoing maintenance and repairs. Um, the third goal is that we plan uh, for the long-term for, for facility replacement and upgrades um, and in, anticipate the necessary funding you know, way ahead, uh, ahead of time. Uh, that, is, that is the way that you, you build a program and do things over time and prepare uh, uh, for the future. Uh, by having a really well thought out and detailed plan that you, you, that you, you revisit regularly. And then I think what really um, another goal is more of a process goal and that's make sure that we're doing this collaboratively. Uh, with DPW, the city treasurer um, and the public schools you know, that we're developing and, and follow through, following through on, on feasible timelines and working together to identify, identify that, that funding together. So those are some pretty practical, but also in many ways lofty goals. And it really matters about doing it, um, you know, every year annually, and then also through within, within every year as well and keeping at it together. So uh, just so you know, just I just wanna update um, the counselors on, you know, our process and what we'll be doing every year. You know, it's me with each principal, that's the directors of uh, our, our directors of our department. So IT, special education, transportation, food service. All these areas have specific needs for maintenance projects, repairs, capital improvements, furniture. Um, through that process, we developed a comprehensive list of all the projects those folks are aware of and their needs um, and improvements over the next two or three years. And you know, folks weren't really accustomed to being asked that question I found. And so they forgot things. And so we'll hear about more things next year that we didn't hear this year, but that's okay. What we want people to do is get into the habit of, of, of looking for what is necessary to keep things, um, you know, repaired and maintained properly 
and then make sure that they're aware of that they can get, you know, that we can be planful about it and timeline and plan for projects uh, over time. So that's a, a skill we're developing and we'll develop further. Uh, we meet monthly with uh, Mike Hale and Joe Lucido to discuss the identified needs. So that was in the plant. We meet monthly to work on uh, existing challenges and check in on those, but also over the last few months on going through that, that list of projects and, and, and future projects to make sure we're on the same page of what they are, what the scope is, when they can be timelined for, that sort of thing. And then also uh, Mike's helped me quite a bit um, with you know, just a process for identifying funding and also working with John Dunn as well have helped me to you know, um, understand you know, the different sources. Um, we, we've been working to create alignment on our, on our priorities, on scheduling, sequencing funding. So those aren't uh, yet determined in any way, shape, or, you know, in a, in, a, in a detailed or concrete way. There's still a little bit of a black box for me around how actually the projects do ultimately get decided and, and which ones and when, but, but that's because it's my first time through the process. So I'll be getting a better understanding of that as we go forward. Um, so let me just jump into here are a few different areas. So first we'll start with maintenance and improvements. This is uh, the short list of, of the work that DPW um, and to some degree, our, our folks will be doing uh, this, um, this summer. And these are the, the bigger projects. What you don't see here are the, are the annual summer maintenance and upkeep. You know, the floors, the cleaning, the painting, the washing. So those are big, big pieces that our DPW staff just helps, helps us with tremendously. But these are some sort of bigger projects um, that are, um, you know, necessary or they're improving instruction or the core program. So you see the... Um, continuing to strengthen and improve the O'Malley Science Center um, by making some space that will be, be uh, more uh, better utilized for classrooms and our students. You'll see that um, in, in the beam and beam in, we need um, some extensive patching on our, uh, in our blacktop, both in the courtyard where kids play, but also in the back parking lot. And not able to completely repave those, but we'll be doing um, some extensive patching uh, to make sure those places are safe for kids and cars. Um, Plum Co. working on some flooring, it's got to be replaced. Um, I redo a project that was that was um, wasn't quite done uh, properly by the contract, the outside external contractors, and so DPW has been been doing a great job hounding these folks. Um, hoping to also make some improvements at the up, up the Beeman Teachers Lunchroom, but also things like the student bathrooms at at, uh, at the high school. Um, you know, there are ongoing troublesome roof leaks uh, in a couple of places at the high school in O'Malley. DPW keeps attacking those, you know, step by step, trying to identify those. And, and then West Parish, um, you know, just routine maintenance there, um, refinishing some wood surfaces, both the gym floor and the, and the pillar casing. So just to try to give you an example of some of the things that the DPW and the schools are working on um, this summer um, and plan to make some progress on. Uh, so then there's um, larger projects and these typically require some sort of, um, not necessarily financing, but longer, a little bit longer term planning. These are in the pipeline at this point. We've been discussing them with John Dunn and, 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 and Mike Hale and things as glamorous as the grease trap replacement at GHS and O'Malley. They have a lifespan, they're beyond the lifespan. Um, they need to be, they need be, need to be addressed and, and they're pretty much in the short term on these. These are things that have failed in the past, uh, during the school year in the past 12 months. GHS locker replacement, um, that's something that was uh, started already and we hope to continue it. Um, and then another piece here is uh, really about expanding and, and extending the lifespan of our buildings. So uh, exterior painting of Plum Cove and Beeman. These are things that may happen this year, may happen next year, but they're the types of projects that we have to work closely with the city on to identify uh, the funding sources and then, and then um, uh, some, of the, some of them need project managers. And then also you need to, of course, uh, make sure that the timeline fits for who does the work and when the work is done. So these are some examples of uh, where the funding can come from. Uh, if I misspeak, John Dunn is welcome to correct me. Uh, but that could be capital budget from the city. It could be financing. That could be stabilization fund. That could be also the capital budget from the uh, schools. We're trying to increase that this year. So we have some capacity to do some of these projects, these smaller products, or maybe one of these larger projects. That's something we're hoping to be able to do in our budget, which I hope you've seen. Um, and then moving on, there are a few ongoing major capital projects, which you know about. I'll give you a little update on the timeline, the work happening on the security upgrades. 
uh, for the entryways at GHS and O'Malley in one second. And of course, as we talked about, uh, the East Gloucester Veterans School continues to be on time and, uh, and on budget. And we expect that to, uh, we appreciate the city council support, the school committee support, the building committee support, the voters support on that. And I uh, expect that to keep going um, uh, uh, as scheduled. And we'll continue to work with everyone to make sure that happens. Um, just wanna dig in a little bit on the um, O'Malley and GHS school security upgrade. So here's the timeline. These are, we're having weekly meetings with the project team every week now on this as we head towards school closing uh, on the 16th. And, um, and then uh, it goes into full bore um, to get these up, up and finished and um, done by the new school year. So off first, of course, is folks moving out. Then construction begins uh, late, late in June. There's, um, you know, one of the buildings, O'Malley will go a little bit before um, GHS, will be sort of be, be uh, sort of a week ahead um, uh, on um, demolition and construction. Uh, and then we will, uh, by, you know, partway through August, be ready to set up, move in, and then ready for office staff return August 26. So that is a very tight timeline, like projects typically are. But uh, the team and the project, the project group is putting everything in place to go, go, go once school's over with. So that's a, a pretty big deal. And that's going to um, have allow uh, folks to have uh, better sight lines, um, have uh, more secure front entrances. Um, you can you know, make sure you know someone and they're identified, identifiable before they move into the building. Um, and it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's the modern approach to school buildings. It's the type of entryway we have at West Parish. We will have at the new East Gloucester and Veterans Building. Um, and you know, uh, now really, really pleased that by the time school starts in the fall, we'll have those safe and secure entrance entry, entryways at at O'Malley and uh, the high school as well. So, um, and then uh, the last piece here is long-term capital infrastructure investments. Um, I'm going to start by just mentioning the bottom three here um, and then dig in more into the modulars. So these are um, typical you know, projects that you have to plan for the longer term on. They sustain facilities for the long term. Um, and they typically require working with the city on you know, multi-year planning, budgeting, or financing. So I'm going to jump down to the O'Malley single, uh, single pane windows. These are windows that are, I, th I think they're ri the original windows. They're single pane. They are problematic on many levels in terms of energy efficiency, uh, really making heating and cooling more complicated. Uh, they don't fend off the sun and they uh, you know, contain the heat. Um, and one of the elements of that is, of course, of course, making them more fuel efficient or fuel effective, um, energy efficient, sorry, but also improve our staff work conditions. Um, you will see coming before you um, a request to approve a statement of, of interest for uh, submission to the MSBA for their accelerated uh, repair program this month. That's due June 1st. Um, just want to be clear that um, while it would be nice to get involved in that program this year, we don't expect to. Typically at this point, the way MSBA is working is you're in line for a few years before they accept you. So um, I'm not optimistic in any way, shape or form that this, this would start anytime soon, but we do have to start getting into the process and that means applying annually. So we'll apply this year, uh, except to apply next year. And if you know we get accepted in the next two or three years, I think we'd be in good shape there. But wanna, again, plan these things out, timeline, timeline them, um, looking at the future and make sure we're prepared to go when we can. To Blackburn, um, I'll talk about that in one moment. And then transportation, we do have a question about how can we maintain our buses and repair them. Um, this is, um, you know, I think uh, one thing to look at, although maybe quite difficult is, is there some way to, um, to build this in conjunction with um, the work to where we might repair fire, police and other vehicles. But that's a sort of way down the list and, and I think quite in the distance. Um, I want to jump back to the uh, preschool administration building at 2 Blackburn. This is something that's come up in a numerous times in the past. There have been considerations to purchase the building. We, of course, have that option still. Um, there was a study that was completed, but not, you know, really looked at too thoroughly. I think it's because COVID hit. Um, but there were some estimates. And, you know, the really, the point I'm hoping to make, and, and, and we'll hope to work on with the school community in the next six to 12 months is, just sort of um, 
you know, putting this to rest? Is it going to mean we should buy the building or, and, and find a new home for administration or um, are they combined, continue to be combined at two Blackburn? Um, but rather than having it sort of sitting out there undecided and sort of on, you know, cons uh, not fully considered, you know, can we just really come work it, work the, the, the process through and, and come to a, a conclusion on really what should be the long-term path for that? Um, there are updates that are needed. We are hesitant, obviously, to put any, any dollars into a leased building um, uh, when there's the open question about whether we you know, would stay here or not. Um, I will say that that study that was done, um, there are no inexpensive options. Um, they looked at uh, moving administration or preschool into O'Malley and also to the high school. But that's the work that the school committee will do and ultimately you know, work with the city council on as we explore that more, uh, more in depth. Um, but that's again, six, to, we're looking to hopefully come to a, some sort of decision or pathway on that in the next six to 12 months. Um, any, any changes would happen after that, but at least hopefully we'd have a, a, real, a real concrete plan. The most important thing for tonight, which I, which I really want to um, impress upon folks is something that um, we've been talking about for quite some time. Um, it's clear now with, um, you know, the, the progress on um, the East Gloucester Veterans Building that at some point we'll also have to uh, do the same with Beeman and Plum Cove in terms of replacing those buildings um, in some way, shape or form. Not, not sure how that's gonna happen yet, but we, it is becoming clear as a timeline. It is likely that we'll need these buildings for the next 10 years, maybe longer than that. Uh, certainly not much shorter than that in terms of timing it out, uh, planning it, uh, you know, ultimately funding it. Uh, that's still ways out. We would all would hope to do that in the next, you know, you know, few years, but that's probably uh, pretty unlikely. So what that means we have to do is make sure those buildings last for another decade or so. Um, and right now, the biggest risk to that are the modulars. Uh, you've heard you've heard about these. Uh, these are expected to be temporary buildings. They were installed for the most part in 2008. They're been there for 13 years. They're past their expected lifetime at this point, from what I understand from Mike Hale. Um, and that means that you know, that they're, the sheathing, the flashing, the envelope aren't expected to live beyond those, that, that, that time frame. Um, they're not designed to replace the roofs and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, we are seeing problems. We're seeing leaks that are regular. We're seeing mold issues in the summertime that have to be remediated each summer before school opens, uh, uh, the rodents as well. Um, and I think one thing that's really clear um, I know the school committee has heard from Mike Hale before, but Mike, um, myself, John Dunn are certainly in agreement and trying to work together to figure out how this can get done. Um, and we'll need to work with the school committee uh, and the city council to, to see how we can get it done. Um, the, the, the hopeful, the most optimistic would be to plan this upcoming year and replace uh, summer 2022. Um, there's still a lot of questions to be done to see if that's actually possible or not. But um, I don't talk too much about the, the financing and funding of that. John Dunn is the expert on that, but um, we all, the three of us do see the, the really important need. If we're gonna make these schools last for at least 10 years, um, these modules won't make it. Um, and they are you know, an integral part of the whole operation there. These are um, in some ways, some of the, they're some of the they're largest classrooms um, and they are certainly um, you know, half the buildings in some ways. So. Uh, integral to those those two schools continuing to be up and running um, before. So that's what we have for tonight. Um, I don't talk as slowly and del deliberately as Jonathan Pope and, 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 and James Cook. I'm working on it, but I'm not there quite yet. So sorry if that was sort of a blur, but happy to answer questions. And uh, as soon as I can get this thing off my screen um, and hope that was uh, informative. It was. Um, so, um, Jonathan, you want me to go first? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Uh, Councilor Gilman. Yeah, this was so very helpful. Thank you so much, Superintendent. Really appreciate it. So, one of my questions is um, <clears throat> historically, we've always had someone on staff of the schools that also had grants as a component of their job. So I just, I, I just, when when we talk about looking for a timeline for funding, 
um, working with school committee, city council, and the mayor, which is which is great. It's basically starting off letting us know what the needs are. But I'm just wondering if we definitely have our arms around all of the possible grants that are out there, in addition to MSBA and the safe streets and um, you know, just because sometimes when we know that something is a mandatory expense and we see it coming, um, I, I just would feel good knowing that we've tried every, every possible way to, to get that expense mitigated by some grants. So just, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, just we have to do that, but I'm just planting a seed that I think we do okay with grants and I love the things that you've talked about with grants and I know what we did with Beeman with our grants for safe and what um, Kathy Clancy was talking about it's great. But um, just plan to see that maybe there are grants out there that we can be grabbing because it certainly helps us. I, I think it's a, it's a great great um, especially now I think it's a, it's a great point to make um, Councilor Gilman. Uh, I think you know. In terms of our grant, we don't have a person who, who specifically on grants, you know, that's really divided among many folks. I mean, and, and the three main players are um, Greg Bach, um, Patty Wegman, our special education director, uh, Chris Castle, our Title I director. And then honestly, there's a lot of support from that for smaller things throughout the schools, right? Um, having said that, though, that crew and, and, and all of them do a very remarkable job, a job I've been very impressed by in terms of pursuing grants, identifying grants, getting them out there quickly, you know, having good success. I mm -hmm. will say this, and it's great for folks to keep their eyes open for us because it's hard to, you know, I'm not saying we, we get all of them, right? But um, there, there is some, I, I don't know, know this, the details quite yet, and they haven't been quite ma made quite that clear, but I do know that some of the COVID funding, we certainly use COVID funding for facilities this past year, or this current year for HVAC and ventilation, and the city was incredibly helpful on that. It does seem that some of the COVID, COVID funding um, from the federal government is also available for capital projects. Um, so that might be a place, that, that's what comes to mind immediately when you ask that question. So again, I don't know the details on that. We will look into that, obviously. Those rules haven't been made, you know, made detailed for us quite yet from the state, but they will be. So I think it's a, it's a great point and it's something that we should all you know, really continue to, we'll continue to work on and, and uh, I'm sure John and Kenny Costa will, will help, us, help us with that. Great, thank you so much. Sure. All right, thank you, Val. Any other councilor questions? All right, seeing none, I'll hand it back over to uh, Chairman Pope. Any school committee questions, Joel? Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I've been I'm lurking for a while. I'm sorry I was late. I was over at the ZBA. One of the hazards of having uh, virtual meetings is that there's, there's plenty of room to double book meetings across the city now. Um, anyway, so in speaking of capital planning, seeing as I have a captive audience of the city council, which I um, always look forward to, uh, let me just start off with a real quick 30 second Gloucester history lesson for those who don't already know this. But the short version is back in the 1970s, the city was first made aware that it was probably going to have to do the combined sewer overflow project. And there were people at the time that said, well, it probably makes a lot of sense to get this over with before, you know, it gets you know, too expensive. And another group of people said, are you crazy? Do you know how much work that'll be? You know, let's not do it. And the city unfortunately chose what was at the time the easier path. And the result was we ended up doing the work, you know, a couple of decades later at full price and spent way more money as a city than we really needed to have just done the hard thing at the time. And so that ties into what we're talking about tonight, because I want to just remind everybody when we talk about the Beeman and Plum Cove um, modulars and what we're buying time for, we're talking about, you know, right now the default would be replace those schools with a new combined school. However, um, Right now, or I should say that's not fair, in two years from now, there will be more than enough classrooms in Gloucester and Rockport to service all students from both districts using only GHS, O'Malley, West Parish, New EG Vets, and the Rockport campus. There's a, a K through 12 campus in that town, if you don't know. If we consolidate with the Rockport School District, we will not need, among other benefits, which I will not get into, we will not need to replace Plum Cove and Beeman with a new structure. There'll be more than enough space with existing buildings. 
And the new beam in Plum Cove, if it's gonna be built for the current populations in a decade, is gonna be a hundred million dollar school. And so what I'm saying, what I'm imploring to the powers that be right now is that if you know we work to, com to combine these school districts, I think they're having a, their first override vote this week, maybe tonight even, because they're, they're short on money also. If we, if we go through this process, it's gonna be really hard work and it could take, you know, it could take 10 years before it's over. But even if it is really hard for 10 years, and we can save $100 million on the back end by not rebuilding Plum Cove and Beeman, that was a great deal. That was $10 million a year saved for 10 years of really hard work. And so I'm just asking anybody and everybody who's gonna be serving in these roles that this time around, when we get to this fork, we do the hard thing now instead of spending millions and millions of dollars later because we chose not to do the hard thing at the outset. I'll get off my soapbox now and uh, thank you very much. Okay. Um, if that was only our decision, um, it would be a lot easier. Unfortunately, there's another party involved. Um, Laura. I have nothing nearly as grand as that. Um, just um, a small point, um, having been at Beeman today, it looked like they are starting to patch, um, at least very temporarily, some of the courtyard. So I was excited that we weren't stepping in the mud um, there, but um, I was just happy to see that some of that sort of emergency stuff was already starting to be done. Yeah, my understanding uh, when I was, um, uh, when I learned that there, some of the patching was happening, uh, I happened to have a, a monthly meeting with with uh, Mike Hale, and 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 he said that was a sort of you know early sort of um, urgent patching that they can do while schools open. The the bigger work, and again, it won't be comprehensive repaving; it'll be just larger patches um, that won't be so temporary. That that'll happen this summertime. So he that's what he explained to me, and so um, it, it is a good step forward. It's one step of 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 the larger steps that'll happen this summer. That was great. And just one other quick thing, um, as far as the security updates, which of course are fantastic at GHS and O'Malley, there's going to be, um, you know, as we learned last night, there's going to be sort of lots of kids uh, in the summer programs there this summer. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming there's a plan for how to sort of have that work going on and have the kids yeah, they're doing, they're having they have temporary entrances, that sort of thing that'll, you know, be, you know, with the offices. Um, the, I can't, James, don't, I, I think the, um, they're moving entryway for, you know, to the old entrance. Okay, I'm not sure which old entrance, I can't remember, honestly, sorry. But no, but the, a full plan for how to enter and exit. Uh, there'll be, you know, staff entrances, the offices will be moving over there, so that sort of thing. So, yeah, we'll have, um, that'll be well signed and, and well explained and that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions or comments? Anything from the city council before we wrap up? Right Can I just say, well, sorry, one more thing I forgot to say, Kathy did, which just because just that I do want to really, really acknowledge um, the DPW and the work that they do with our schools. Um, and it's been great working with Joe and Mike from, I, from my perspective, but even more so, you know, they get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of work orders and tickets, you know, throughout the school year. Uh, the staff is fast at replying. They are also some more complicated ones they've got to work on over time, but we'll share later this year or later the school year, just in a couple of weeks, just what the percentage is on that. And they're very, very high, um, but it's a great system. Uh, I mean, they have a great outfit and, our schools couldn't do without it. And also my understanding is it's a vast improvement, you know, from, from years ago. Um, it's been doing, going very well for a number of years, but, but I just um, uh, really appreciative of, of that partnership and all they do for us and, and our students and our staff and, and we couldn't do without them. Councilor Gilman. So I really need to echo on what Superintendent um, Lummis just said. I was on the school committee when we made the difficult decision to change how we handled public works. And at the time, the school committee used to handle it. And we decided to make a very controversial at the time vote to 
partner with the city and allow the city to do the job. And uh, the, the improvements have been very process oriented. They've been very, um, very professionally done. And it's really a, a tribute to making a really good decision back when we needed to. And it wasn't an easy decision. Like I said, lots of controversy. And, um, but I'm really glad that we did for the things that you've all said about all the positive improvements. So thank you, Public Works, for all that hard work. Kathy? Um, yeah, I think in the lead off, um, hopefully my conveyance of, of gratitude and, um, and really jobs well done all around on the DPW have been uh, really quite a boost to, to our schools and our students. Um, and I also wanna say that Mike Hale is the one who's been saying for years that his, the, our modulars keep him up at night. Um, so I hope, I hope people have heard that, you know, we've kind of talked about modulars at the school committee level for a long time, but he, every year when we talk to him about budget and about capital, that is number one on his list. So, um, so we're glad that we're at this point where the city um, can really consider replacing them because some of the learning that's, you know, that's compromised, you know, as, as you know, with these Gloucester and veterans, when the conditions are not good, um, they become more of a distraction than they are a help to the educational process. And now um, I would gather that, you know, soon the modulars would be more of a safety issue. So, uh, you know, we're, we're behind in terms of its lifespan, but we're also not at the end of the lifespan, we're at probably the best point we can to thoughtfully plan the replacement, um, you know, in conjunction with, you know, getting the city council support and working with John Dunn, who's just been a tremendous um, partner in terms of planning and, and uh, you know, giving us the straight answer and the straight, the straight talk about how you get things done, um, if you can get them done, um, you know, managing our expectations and hopefully we're at a point where we are optimistic that it'll become a reality. Uh, Steve, I don't see any more questions or discussions. Are we, uh, yeah, I think we're ready to wrap it up. What we'll do is I'll have a little closing statement and then I'll, I'll adjourn the city council and hand it back over to you. So um, I just wanna thank um, Superintendent Lummis, uh, Principal Cook, Chairman Pope and the entire school committee for hosting this meeting this evening. Um, you know, like I said earlier, I, I wish we had a magic wand for the traffic, uh, but I think with the, the issues that were brought up this evening and the, the issues that have been brought up to the city council over the past several years, um, we need to put our heads together with the administration and really try to come up with a traffic plan moving forward and uh, see if we can alleviate this. But uh, once again, thank you for all in attendance tonight and hosting this and um, looking forward to the next one. So thank you guys. And I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn the city council. So moved. Second. All right, it's been moved by Councilor Holmgren, seconded by Councilor Gilman. And I will call for the roll call. Councilor LeBlanc. Yes. Councilor O'Hara. Yes. Councilor Pat. Yes. Councillor Gilman? Yes. And Councillor Holman? Yes, and thank you. Go yellow to go green. There you go. Thank you. And now uh, the City Council is adjourned. Well, I'd like to uh, thank um, the City Council for listening to us and, and, and understanding um, <clears throat> where we're coming from and uh, asking um, good and, and, and thoughtful questions and um, uh, I think this collaboration is something that we need to um, build upon. Um, so that being said, thanks again. And um, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Okay. Maria, could we have a roll call vote? Yes. Mayor Taken. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ms. Watson. Yes. Ms. Wiesen. Yes. Kathy Clancy. Yes. Mr. Favaza. Yes. And Chairman Pope. Yes. Um, 
Yeah, it's unanimous. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you Thank very you guys. much. Good night. Thank you all. See you all you. soon.